Much of what you read about the environment is shocking and depressing. We tend to get caught up talking about the problems, and there are many. Today I want to talk about solutions. Don't worry, these solutions may address complex problems, but this isn't about advanced science or major human sacrifice. It's about people and how they can empower change to protect our rare planet. Some of you are new to conservation, and many of you undoubtedly know very little about rare. So I'm going to tell you a story about rare's beginnings, and then I'm going to share with you a glimpse of our future. Once upon a time, about 1977 to be exact, there was a tropical Caribbean island called St. Lucia. How many of you have ever been there? This gorgeous St. Lucian parrot, found nowhere else on Earth, perched dangerously close to extinction. This was the outlook in the late 70s. Only 100 individuals existed in the wild. Extinction was predicted, virtually guaranteed, by the year 2000. So ask yourself, what would you do if you wanted to save a species from the brink of extinction? Or if you couldn't come up with a solution yourself, who would you hire for the job? The country of St. Lucia hired this guy, the unlikeliest of conservation heroes, Paul Butler, a recent graduate of London Polytechnic, which he calls the only unprestigious college in the whole British Empire. Paul was excited and ambitious about ways that he could find, using traditional conservation approaches, to save the parrot. He thought about wildlife protection laws, or fines for poachers who sell parrots to international buyers, and the creation of a forest preserve to protect the parrot's habitat. These were good, traditional conservation ideas. But there was one big problem. All these changes would require new laws. New laws require popular support. And there simply wasn't any. In fact, most people on the island had never even heard of the bird. Some of them were still eating it. So how do you build public support for an unfamiliar bird? Well, you market it. Paul started a unique marketing campaign to rally the public around the St. Lucian parrot. Hand-painted billboards encouraged the people of St. Lucia to take pride in a national treasure. You can see it right here. Take pride in St. Lucia. Paul created a popular character, Jaco the parrot, and he gave him his own comic book. Paul and his Jaco mascot visited every classroom and helped popularize the campaign's theme song. Amazona Versicolor. Paul even convinced the local telecom company that they should show the world just how much bigger and more beautiful the St. Lucia parrot is than a well-known symbol from the north. Eventually, St. Lucia's newly emerging symbol of pride was elected the national bird. It made its way all the way to the passport. The message of the campaign was clear. This bird is ours. It's a source of pride, and we must protect it. Paul's nonstop grassroots marketing campaign became known as a pride campaign because that's exactly what it instilled in every St. Lucian. Pride created public support. Public support fueled change. As a result, St. Lucians stopped hunting the parrot. They stopped putting them in cages, and they started reporting poachers and sticking those they caught in jail. You'll recall there were 100 left in the wild in 1977. St. Lucian parrot was once considered a lost cause for an idealistic conservationist. But today we're celebrating a soon-to-be-published study which shows the parrot population at over 1,800 individuals in the wild. It's fair to say that without Paul Butler's pride campaign, the St. Lucian parrot would be extinct. For his efforts, these tremendous efforts and this great success, St. Lucia made Paul an honorary citizen. And then a tiny conservation organization, Rare, offered to help him repeat his feat in other islands around the Caribbean. That was 20 years ago. This is what Rare looks like today. Rare's launched more than 200 pride campaigns in over 50 countries. People in rural communities around the world are taking pride in their natural assets and mobilizing the behavior change that's necessary to advance conservation and ensure benefits for local people. Behavior change is a very nuanced challenge. You think about your own life. How many diets have you started? Or how many times have you tried to quit smoking? Or how many other major shifts have you tried to make in your behavior? It's not easy. Using Paul's method as a template, Rare's developed a sophisticated curriculum that's tailored for individual communities and environmental threats 
to train local leaders to become agents of change. I won't go into all the details here, but if you want to know more about the process, I'm happy to go through it in, in, in as much detail as you'd like. The point is, it's working. In Mexico in 2002, Rare Conservation Fellow Salvador Garcia used a pride campaign to reduce forest fires by 78%, changing the way farmers use prescribed burns. In 2005 in Indonesia, Sari Warawan, who now works for Rare, training local conservation leaders, ran her own pride campaign and in the process convinced local fishermen to stop using cyanide for fishing. She also helped create a one million acre national marine park, both of which were sizable victories for conservation in Indonesia. In 2009, more recently, Lang Jimin reduced consumption of wild game in northern China to help save the Siberian tiger. We're proud of our track record at Rare, and we measure all of our successes and even our failures quite rigorously. You can't know you're winning unless you're keeping score, and we are certainly winning. Because with Rare, when the work gets done, it stays done. Pride doesn't fade, and that means conservation becomes a community ethic. We think Rare can do even more for people and the planet, though. And recently, we've identified a problem with a promising solution in which pride can have an even greater impact around the world. Rare can play a unique role in helping communities address overfishing, especially in near-shore communities in the developing tropics. The data on global fish stocks are pretty depressing. These 40-year graphs of fish landings for different regions around the world look a lot like the trajectory of the St. Lucian parrot back in the 70s. Only instead of the loss of an endangered species on one small island, scientists are predicting the loss of entire habitats. And in fact, fisheries, which mean ways of life. Some basic facts to consider. There are roughly 100 million fishers in the world, most in the developing tropics. 98, maybe 99% of these fishers are local, working to put food on the tables of their communities. For this reason, greening Walmart's supply chain will do little for the people who most depend on fish for protein. Those are laudable efforts working on corporate supply chains, but they're not actually going to address the problem most people face. Fish is the chief source of protein for more than a billion people. So you quickly see that overfishing isn't just an environmental problem, it's becoming a humanitarian crisis. The question is, can we do for local fisheries what Paul Butler did for the St. Lucian parrot? What gives us hope is a promising approach to fisheries management, scientifically proven, to increase fish stocks and biodiversity. It's called a no-take zone. Here's how it works. Step one, a local official declares a marine protected area and shuts off access to all outsiders. But step two, in the process, guarantees fishing rights to local fishers as long as they agree to respect, and here's step three, a no-take zone where fishing is strictly prohibited. Fish get bigger inside a no-take zone. They produce far more fish, and the locals enjoy what's called the spillover effect. In a way, this lets a fishery become like a natural annuity. You can see here that one large snapper produces as many eggs as 250 small snapper. The ocean may be the only place where getting fatter and older is actually a good thing. And big fish may be the best insurance policy we can offer some of the poorest, most vulnerable communities on our planet, especially when you think about the rising level of oceans uh, and tides and climatic events. A sustainable fishery is a pretty good insurance policy. No-take zones are a promising biological solution, but we're not naive. There's friction in the short term. No-take zones require fishers to stop fishing in areas where they have been making their livelihoods. That takes a lot of community buy-in. Studies have shown that social cohesion and strong local leadership are two of the most important contributors to a successful community-managed fishery. But recall that this is the challenge that Paul Butler faced in St. Lucia. This is exactly the problem that Rare has been built to tackle. Pride can inspire public support for the kind of change needed to sustainably manage fisheries. Towards this end, Rare just launched 31 Pride campaigns to create no-take zones in the Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and the Ecuador's Galapagos Islands. This is a great start 
but there are literally thousands of coastal communities facing the same threats. So why not a dozen more campaigns, or a hundred more, or a thousand more? Rare's plan is to train a Paul Butler, a rare conservation fellow, from communities all over the world, and help them cultivate the pride that already exists in those communities, and mobilize that pride to create a nearshore fishing revolution. No take zones offer a win-win that you rarely find with conservation, where you can manage for local economies while at the same time protect food security and biodiversity. And there are other win-win solutions for issues like watershed protection and deforestation that RARE is also replicating around the world. These RARE conservation fellows who are out there working day in, day out, replicating solutions and inventing their own, they're really our heroes at RARE. These are the people that are working in some of the most remote villages on the planet. They're working in absolutely unglamorous and trying circumstances. They're dealing with the greatest inertia to change at the very root of the problem in these communities. And they're the reason that RARE does everything it does. They're the reason I'm here. They're our hope for conservation globally. And helping support their efforts is job one for RARE in the coming years.